If I were to say the name Lyman Beecher this morning, I wonder how many would be familiar with him because I don't think really he's too much of a household name. But if you lived in the 18th century, Lyman Beecher was a Presbyterian minister, he was a prominent theologian, and he was involved in the more conservative part of the Second Great Awakening that took place in America. He was considered at that time one of the greatest minds and one of the greatest thinkers in the world. And whilst Lyman Beecher would end up going down a path where he'd be tried for heresy, we shouldn't just automatically discount everything that that man had to say. Because one day he was asked the following question. He said, what is the greatest thing that anyone can do on this earth? And Lyman Beecher, he thought about it for a while. He pondered it through in his mind. And then this is the answer that he gave. He said, the greatest thing that a person can do in this world is not to be a rocket scientist. It's not to be a medical doctor. It's not to be a world leader such as the president. But the greatest thing that anyone can do is bring a human being to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I thought about that answer, I began to think about one of the disciples that we've read here in John's gospel as this man, Andrew. Because that's exactly the type of man Andrew was. He was a man who was continually bringing people to Christ. And we're going to see that in a little more detail later on in the message. But Andrew, you think about him as one of the disciples. He's not what I would describe as one of the most well-known. He's not the most popular of the disciples. Because apart from Judas Iscariot, we often think of the disciples in terms of the big three. You have Peter, you have James, and you have John. And why do I say that? Because you read the scriptures. And very often, those three names are referenced together. You go there to the Mount of Transfiguration with the Lord Jesus Christ. And who does he bring with him? He brings Peter, James, and John. You go to the raising of Jairus' daughter there as well. Who did you bring with them? It's Peter, James, and John. What about the Garden of Gethsemane? Yes, the other disciples are there. But who are the three that are told to come a little further with Christ? Again, it's Peter, James, and John. Many ways, we might be inclined to describe Andrew as one of the lesser disciples then. He's just below that top tier. And Andrew would live a life in many respects playing second fiddle to his brother, Simon Peter. And I say that because you read very often, whenever those names are mentioned in the Word of God, this is the little subs uh, subscription that you get, or inscription you get here. You see it in John chapter 1, but we also see it in those times, those lists where the 12 disciples are given. Because in Matthew chapter 10, for example, in verse 2, you have the list in the first four verses, and we read this. It says, The first Simon who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. You see, Andrew continually lived in the shadow of his brother Peter. Peter was the more outspoken of the disciples. In fact, you read the word of God, and Peter, he speaks more than any other of the disciples. Andrew is the quiet brother. And when I think about that, then I can relate to that I feel, because being one of five children, I was the quiet brother. My mom often called me her quiet wee man, and I don't know where she got the wee from because you just have to look at me this morning, and I'm not exactly wee. Maybe I was then, but I don't, I don't know. I remember very vividly every year going to those parent-teacher meetings, those dreaded ones where your teachers tell your parents how you're getting on. And it was always the same. They said, well, Greg's not too bad. He's doing okay with his work. He's getting on okay. But you know what? We're really concerned because he's just so quiet. And the remarkable thing to note here about Andrew in all that I've said here is his character because we never read here of Andrew being jealous of Peter. He's never jealous of the other disciples. He's never jealous of Peter's prominence or his preaching ability. Andrew could have said, you know, why was the first to be called by the Lord Peter? You only are what you are, Peter, because I was the one who brought you to Christ. But you know, Andrew displays a humility here, an attitude that is far too infrequent within Christianity today. Because Andrew was happy to take that step back. He was happy to be that one cheering on from the sidelines. He was content to serve the Lord in whatever way he could. And he did it with the utmost of satisfaction and with great joy. And I believe his mantra in life was very much similar to that of his mentor, John the Baptist. He must increase and I must decrease. But just because Andrew doesn't receive the same attention as Peter does, we're not to think that that somehow means that Andrew wasn't as useful for the Lord. In fact, like Lyman Beecher stated, I believe that Andrew was involved in one of the greatest works that a Christian can be involved in, and that is bringing others to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And with that said this morning, that's really what I want to study with you. It's Andrew here. It's the attitude that he has. And we're going to do that by considering just two thoughts with you. We're going to see the man Andrew was and then the ministry that Andrew was involved in. So who was Andrew? Who is this man here that we read about in John's Gospel? Well, I have a number of thoughts with respect to who he was. Because I believe here we see in John chapter 1 something of Andrew's faith. You read what's said in John chapter 1, verses 35 to 37. Again the next day, after John stood and two of his disciples and looked upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. The preacher on this occasion, of course, was John the Baptist. He's the forerunner of Christ. He's the one tasked with preparing the way for Christ. You read about that back in Isaiah chapter 40. And therefore, it's no surprise here that we find John the Baptist, and what's he doing? He's preaching about Christ. We read those verses there, John chapter 1, verse 36. What does he say? He says, Behold the Lamb of God. And you'll be aware of this, I'm sure, but this is the second time he's preached the message. He preached the exact same message the day before in John chapter 1 and verse 29. Those famous words, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, was Andrew there the first time the message was preached? Well, we're not sure. The scriptures don't tell us. But it's not really all that important. Because we can be certain here that Andrew was present the second time that John preached this message. And I say that because we read again verse 35. And looking, and the next day after Jesus stood, and two of his disciples. And one of those disciples here was Andrew. John the Baptist, no doubt, he was preaching, he would have preached many things. But these words alone here, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. They were enough to cause Andrew to place his trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And again I say that because look at verse 37. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. You see, Andrew saw Christ. Andrew realized that Christ was able to take away the sin that he had. And because of that, we read that Andrew immediately put his trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I make that point in passing this morning because maybe you've come to the Lord's house and maybe you're not saved. You don't know the Lamb of God here. You've never put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what you need to do above anything else today is to see Christ. It's to trust in Christ. It's the only thing that matters right now. To see what Christ has done on the cross and seeing what he's done, it's repenting of your sin and it's putting your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ because only the Lord Jesus Christ is able to take that sin away. Only the Lord Jesus Christ is able to make you right for heaven. We see Andrew's faith, but what about Andrew's fearlessness? If I were to ask you to tell me of those 12 disciples, who's the fearless one? Again, we'd say Peter. Peter was the one always rushing to the fore. He was the prominent one. The Garden of Gethsemane, the soldiers come to arrest Christ. It's Peter who runs to the front. He cuts off Malchus' ear. Matthew chapter 16, what does he say? He says, thou art the Christ. You go to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 4, it's Peter, it's John. They're standing before the Sanhedrin, those religious leaders, and they're preaching Christ. But I put it to you today that Andrew was just as fearless. Whenever people are expecting a child, very often they'll spend a long time deciding upon an appropriate name for that child. And very often what happens is, maybe if it's your firstborn son, very often you'll take your father's name and that carries along the line. Very often as well, people want to pick up names that are unique and that will build character. Names that you go to school with and don't make fun of you, you kind of shorten them, all of those things. But many people will choose a name because of what that name means. And they do it because they hope that in choosing such a name, that that individual is going to live up to that billing. And this really is where Andrew comes into his own here. Because Andrew, you might know this, but Andrew's name means manly. And Andrew, we can certainly say he lived up to that name. Because in John chapter 1, Andrew was involved in service. And in verse 37, after he encountered Christ, he's described as a disciple of John the Baptist. And it's upon that basis that I would say that Andrew was fearless, that Andrew was manly. Because to be a disciple or to be a follower of John the Baptist, it was not for the faint-hearted. 
Matthew chapter 3, we see John the Baptist there. He's preaching in the wilderness. He's wearing camel's hair. He's eating locusts and honey. It's not what you and I would describe as the five-star treatment. But Andrew was loyal. Andrew was faithful to the end. You turn your Bibles this morning to Luke's gospel. And Luke records similar words to Matthew, but again with the preaching of John the Baptist here. Luke chapter 3, please. Luke chapter 3, and I just want you, just a couple of words there in verse 7. This is how he describes those he was preaching to. Luke chapter 3, verse 7. O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And then you cast your eyes right back to the beginning of Luke chapter 3 and read the list of who was included here. Luke chapter 3, verse 1. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar... Pontius Pilate being the governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Etheria, and of the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene. You have Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, Herod the tetrarch. These men, their reputation preceded them. They were men known for their ruthlessness, known for their barbarity. You look at verse 2, who's mentioned there? You have Annas and Caiaphas. They're the high priests, and we know all that they would go on to do, how they would be instrumental even in the crucifixion of our Savior. And therefore, not only was John here attacking the ideologies of those in authority, but he's also seen to be attacking the religious leaders of the day. And Herod, he would later later arrest, he would behead John the Baptist, but Andrew remained by his side. Andrew was fearless. So Andrew had faith, Andrew was fearless, but we also see something here of Andrew's fellowship. You look at John chapter 1 again and read verses 38 and 39. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, Being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day for it was about the tenth hour. And you read those words and it's, it's very clear to see that Andrew desired to be with the Lord. He desired that fellowship. He wanted to spend time with him. He wanted that communion with him. And in verse 39, it seems to imply that Andrew spent the entire day with the Lord. It speaks about the tenth hour. That's 4 p.m. Jewish time. It's 10 a.m. if you take the Roman time. And Andrew's desire, above all else, was to have fellowship with Christ. And I read that, and you know what? It really challenged me. Because if I have to be honest with you this morning, as I have to be, I can't remember that me spending an entire day alone with the Lord, in communion with the Lord. And I know it's not always feasible. We have jobs. There's many responsibilities at home, other commitments. But I want to challenge you just next week to do something. I'm not saying to take a whole day, but maybe just one hour. One hour in addition to what you would normally spend as your quiet time or your time alone with the Lord and dedicate that to just fellowshipping with the Lord. Spending time in prayer. And if you and I can't do that, then maybe we need to ask ourselves, well, am I too busy with other things? Because if the answer to that question is yes, then that's when we need to start removing those things. Taking those things away from our lives that are distracting us from time with the Lord. Andrew had faith. Andrew was fearless. He enjoyed fellowship. But I want you to see also that Andrew was a fisherman. And why is that detail significant? I believe it's significant because it dismisses any idea that anyone might have here today that the Lord only uses those who are extraordinarily gifted. He only uses those who are prominent or who occupy influential positions. And yes, of course, we can say he does do that. You take Paul. Paul was a great theologian. He sat under Gamaliel, one of the finest Hebrew scholars of the day. But it's equally true to say that the majority of Christ's disciples, they were what you would call ordinary men. Brothers, tax collectors, zealot, at least four, probably more were fishermen. And what does that show me? It shows me that God doesn't call people based upon their CV. You don't present them with a list of credentials, and on that credentials, then he calls that person. He calls ordinary people. 
and he calls them and he gives them the correct training. He fills their life with the right influences. And you know what? Whenever I think about that, it greatly encourages me. Where I am at now, coming to the end of college, I'm often reminded of those words in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. He's speaking to Peter. He's speaking to Andrew. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Andrew was only able to do what he did because the Lord helped him. Peter was only able to do what he did because the Lord helped him, the same with the other disciples. And again, why do I make the point today? Well, I make the point because how often do we find ourselves, and it's only human nature, but we look around us and we compare ourselves naturally to other people. If I had that person's ability, if I had those circumstances in my life, then I could do something worthwhile. But I'm me, and I can't do those things. I can't preach a sermon on a Sunday. I can't go to the mission field. I can't be a Sunday school teacher. I can't be a youth worker. I can't knock doors. All of those things. Wish I could, but I can't. And people, whenever that happens, they start to think to themselves, well, you know what? I'm absolutely useless. I'm good for nothing. But the truth is that God does not want a church full of exactly the same sort of people Yes, he wants us to be as holy as we can be in these mortal bodies. But he's given us personalities. He's given us talents and gifts. And he's given them to us for a reason. Purpose for our lives is that we will play a part in serving the Lord. That's why he's done it. And all the Lord asks of anyone is that they would be willing to embrace the person that the Lord has made them. To do their best to serving the Lord in whatever circumstances, whatever place the Lord would have them to be. Andrew was an ordinary man. He did ordinary things, did extraordinary things for the Lord. He was a fisherman, and that was enough for the Lord. And having spent then some time really showing you some of the characteristics of this man Andrew was, I want to spend the second half really of the message speaking about the ministry that Andrew was involved in. Because Andrew had a ministry. He had much to do for the Lord. People hear the word ministry. And again, very often we automatically think, well, that's the person, isn't it, who stands in a pulpit on a Sunday or who does the midweek meeting. That's the preacher. Maybe you have in your mind this morning some gifted preacher, some prominent or powerful evangelist who is a gift for leading people to Christ. And the preaching ministry is essential to Christianity. And I would never want to diminish it. Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. But you know what? There's more to the word ministry than simply just preaching. And I make the point because there's nothing evidently in the scriptures to tell us that Andrew ever preached a sermon. Andrew didn't write any letters to the churches. Andrew didn't plant. He didn't establish churches. But Andrew was involved in a very important ministry. A ministry that is important for every single church of God. He had a role to play in the kingdom of God. His ministry was more of a personal, a one-to-one basis. And Andrew was very good at it. Andrew was very committed to it. His ability, his talent was bringing people to the Lord. And I would argue at times that that ministry can just be as effective as preaching a sermon, as much as preaching is essential. Gospel of John here, it gives three occasions in which we see Andrew bringing people to the Lord. And I want to just look at them individually this morning with you. The first one you have before you, it's John chapter 1. You read verses 41 and 42. It says, he findeth first, or he first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Andrew's ministry began in his own home. Andrew brought his brother Simon Peter to the Lord. One day after Andrew himself was saved, he wasted no time in going after his family members. And you know what? Nobody, nobody told him he had to do it. He wasn't forced into it. He wasn't coerced into it. No, Andrew simply had to tell his brother about Christ. It was a natural response to someone who'd met the Lord and he couldn't wait to tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. And as Christians, we will happily go and we'll, we'll speak to strangers. We'll go to people's doors and we'll happily speak to someone we don't know, but don't send me to my family. Don't ask me to speak to my brothers or my sisters or my mother or my father about Christ. I can't do that. And when you think about that, that doesn't make sense in our minds, does it? Because those are our family. Those are the people we should be dying to reach. 
for many reasons, it's just it's so much more difficult at times. It's more difficult because you go to a door and you don't know that person. And they reject you. They say something offensive to you. And you don't, very often you don't even give it a second thought. But with your family, it's different. You have to go back to your family. You have to see them again. There's birthdays. There's Christmas. There's get-togethers. There's, there's food. All of those things. And for whatever reason, that makes it more difficult. But Andrew didn't care. Andrew wanted his brother to experience what he had experienced. He didn't know how important a role Peter was going to play in the church. He didn't know all the Lord was going to do with Peter. He simply wanted Peter to know Christ. And no doubt there are many here this morning, and you're in that situation. You have family members, you have friends who are not saved. Let me challenge you, are you seeking to tell them about Christ? Are you seeking to share the gospel with them, to tell them what the Lord's done for you? What he can do for them? How he can totally change their lives? And as I thought about the passion Andrew had, it challenged me so much. Caused me to ask questions I didn't want the answer to, because I had to ask myself, well... Am I doing everything that I can to reach my family with Christ? And the answer, the only honest answer I could give before the Lord was no. Because of that, I want to challenge you again this morning. Next week, just one time, even if it's one, if it's more than one, great. But one time, speak to a family member. Speak to a friend. Tell them about the Lord. Share your testimony with them. Show them what the Lord has done for you, what he can do for them. You never know what that one conversation could do. That one conversation could see that family member or that friend you've been praying for for a long time saved. See them being called into the Lord's work. We don't need to know what the Lord's going to do with them. We simply need to be like Andrew. We need to bring them to Christ and we need to leave the rest to him. So Andrew here, he brought his family to Christ. But turn with me to John chapter 6. And you know, but don't be familiar with these words, it's the feeding of the 5,000. In verse 5 here, we have Christ speaking to one of the other disciples, a man called Philip. And he asks the question here, at the end of verse 5, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? You look at Philip's response in verse 7. 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. 200 penny worth it equates roughly to 200 denarii, that's the currency of the time, and that was roughly eight months' wages for the average labor, a lot of money. But you read what follows in verses 8 and 9. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? It's interesting to note that you read the four Gospels and they all mention this miracle, the feeding of the 5,000. But only John specifically mentions that it was Andrew who brought the lad to Christ. And again, the scriptures don't tell us how they came into contact with one another. Perhaps Andrew was scouring the crowd. He was looking for someone with food to bring. Maybe the lad approached Andrew. We don't know. Either way, it highlights the ability that Andrew had for reaching people. Whether it was a case he was seeking them out, whether it was a case he was approachable, are they not both characteristics that are very desirable for us to have as believers? Because as believers, we should be endeavoring to seek others for Christ, but we also ought to be approachable. People ought to know we're Christians, and not only Christians, but they can come to us, and they can speak to us openly and freely, and we're not going to turn them away. And people will read this account of John here and they'll say, well, Andrew's faith is weak. Because in verse 9 he asked the question, what are they among so many? But Andrew still brought the lad to Christ. Saw the importance of bringing one person to Christ. And the scriptures continually emphasize the importance of just one soul. You have one example, Luke chapter 15. Those three parables there, you have the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, one of them each time. And in Luke chapter 15 and verse 10, we read the words, Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And therefore may we never think at an insignificant thing that we might only manage to reach one person with the Lord. Because if the Lord saw the need to sit down with the ones, then so should we. 
Because it only cost the sin of one person for the Lord to have to go to the cross and pay the penalty for that sin. And therefore, may we never despise those day of small things. In John chapter 1, he brought his family to Christ. In John chapter 6, he brought a lad, he brought a stranger to Christ. But then turn with me to John chapter 12 very quickly. When you read with me what it says in verses 20 through 22. John chapter 12, verse 20. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. So not only does this account, you read it, you study it, not only does it tell us that the gospel was not to be restricted to the Jews only, but it was also for the Gentile nations of the world. But it also again highlights, I believe, Andrew's ability to bring people to Christ. Because you read that passage, and you have to ask yourself, why doesn't Philip bring them to Christ? Philip was a Christian. Philip was one of the disciples. He knew the Lord. Why does he go to Andrew? He could have brought him himself. Well, maybe Philip thought to himself, well, I'm not sure whether Christ wants to speak to the Gentiles, so I'll go get the advice of Andrew. But could it not be the case that Philip was aware of the talents Andrew had for bringing people to Christ? And Andrew evidently had great social skills. People warmed to him. And again, I say that's a skill that not everybody has. You mightn't be able to stand up and preach. You mightn't be able to do an opener. You mightn't be able to take a lesson in Sunday school. But maybe you're here today and you have great conversational skills. You're a great conversationalist. You, you can talk. Maybe someone well-known or well-liked or well-respected in the community, in the workplace. And I know a man exactly like that. And it's hard to explain, but he just has an aura about him. He speaks to people and they're automatically they're just warm to him. And it doesn't matter what he says to them, they can't help themselves. And he has a great ability to bring people into the church, people that I only wish I could bring in. And I make that point because maybe that is true of somebody here today. The challenge is, are you using your gift to bring people to Christ? Because if that's all your ministry amounts to for the Lord, then there can be no finer work. And Andrew was very good at it. Andrew was committed to doing his best to the Lord, and he never changed. And I say that because you study history, church history. Andrew was crucified. The cross was an X shape because he didn't, he didn't want to die the same way as the Lord. But it took two days for Andrew to die. And on those two days, as he hung on the cross, what did he do? He told everyone who passed by, you need to be saved. Are you a Christian? Do you know the Lord? Andrew was faithful to the end. His chief desire in life and death was simply to point others to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the church, yes, it needs Peter's. The church needs John's, but it also needs Andrew's as well. And the challenge I leave you with this morning is this. Are you willing to be an Andrew? Or do you and I, are we too busy to simply care about others? I was speaking to a man and he said to me, I'm a Christian. I'm saved. I don't pray for anybody else because that's their fault they didn't get saved. May that never be said of any of us. I know it wouldn't be, but what an awful thing to say. Someone prayed for us, didn't they? Be like Andrew. And do your best to bring people to the Lord. If you're not saved this morning, if you know not the Lord, my prayer for you is that you would have the same experience that Andrew had. He said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Andrew heard of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what he heard caused him to realize he was a sinner. And that he needed Christ to forgive his sin. And if you're here today and you're not saved, you can be saved. And you can be saved by realizing today that you have sin. Because we have all sinned, every one of us, the Bible tells us. By recognizing that you cannot do anything to get rid of that sin yourself. And it's by repenting of that sin, turning from that sin. And it's looking to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's trusting in what the Lord Jesus Christ has done on the cross. 
may you experience what Andrew did all those years ago. May you have an experience with Christ this morning. And may you be saved and may your life be changed forever. May God write that word upon our heart and may it challenge us, may it encourage us. There's great encouragement in it, I believe. But I just want to sing a few verses.